paper for this project you will probably need a bigger sheet of paper than we usually use in class. I've done mine on a 9 inch by 12 piece of paper that I have stretched completely flat onto a board and if you want the instructions for that I will link to the video below that helps you stretch your paper. It's really lovely to work on a sheet of paper that doesn't buckle and is completely um, flat on a nice board. Now I have wet the entire sky area and I'm using just thalo blue to start with to put in the blue sky at the top of the clouds. And the reason I like to use a bigger piece of paper for a sky like this is it just gives you more space to work and to make your sky a little bit more dramatic. I'm using a photograph and I'm really sorry I don't know where I got the photograph from. Usually I like to use my own but we've been locked in for a couple of months. I haven't been anywhere to take photographs and I used one that from somebody or from the internet. I don't know where. It's a typical west coast beach scene. I live on the west coast of Canada on Vancouver Island and, and all our beach scenes look like this whether you're in Tofino, Uculet, uh, anywhere. So it's a very familiar sight. Now I've mixed a light grey using burnt sienna, raw sienna, um, ultramarine blue, some permanent rose and I'm putting in some very, very light grey at the bottom of the clouds. And of course the sky is still wet so it can blend. And I just want to leave that to blend in. I don't want to dry it with a hairdryer. I'm just let it blend and I can work on a different part of the painting. I'm mixing up an ultramarine blue with some of the azo yellow and the grey that I made. And I want to put in all of the shadows around the water on the beach. And the reason I'm putting the shadows in first is so that I can clearly see where the white areas are. I haven't masked them or anything. I've just drawn them in pencil. And putting this blue shadow around them helps me to keep them nice and white and I don't get too carried away painting in the sand and go over them. The shadows on the photograph were very blue and there's no reason you can't do this after you've done the sand colour you can do. I just thought this would help me remember where those white patches are going to be. Now this was a very long painting. I did it over a period of two days, two or three days actually I think. So I've had to edit and I've had to um, leave out a few bits that are in the middle where I do the rocks. I'm going to link you to another video, a separate video that I've made just on painting rocks. So you can watch that one separately if you want to. Now I'm putting in the shadow against the shoreline. And if you've ever looked at a picture of the beach or the ocean, you can see that right next to the waves under the waves it's quite a dark shadow and it makes the waves look whiter if you have that dark shadow up against them. And on the beach here by the waves and where it was wet, around those wet areas that are reflecting the sky there's a lot of blue shadow. So that's what I'm putting in right now. And uh, of course I've speeded it up twice the speed so I painted it much, much slower than this. And I've left out a lot of tedious painting that, that would just be too boring for you to watch. I know some of you would like to see the whole process, but really I couldn't make a video that long. I don't have the resources to make it or upload it. So sorry, I, I um, have to just give you an edited version, give you an idea. For those of you that take my class, We'll be going over this in class again and I can show you personally how to do anything that you have questions about. And for those of you that don't take my classes, this is just a free video for you. And uh, this is what my students get as a helpful aid when they are learning with me. So now I'm mixing up an ocean colour. I'm using ultramarine blue, uh, some phthalo green, some azo yellow 
and I want quite a strong colour. I don't, I've got a very light coloured sky, light coloured water. I want my ocean to be nice and strong. So I have to keep dipping back in my colour to pick up lots of colour on my brush. If I keep painting without picking up colour, I'm going to wash that colour out. I'm going to spread it out and it'll be very washed out. I want it to be nice and intense. When you're doing an ocean, make sure your brush strokes are horizontal, unless of course you're doing a reflection of trees or something. The horizontal nature of your brush strokes will help it look like water. You can leave a few white spaces that look like waves. And as I get closer to the shore here, I'm going to make the waves with the white paper. I'm going to sort of model the waves with the paint. As I get closer to shore, I'm picking up a bit more color a bit more ultramarine in the colour to darken the horizon. And I definitely want this to be a dramatic transparent colour and I want it to be done in one layer. If I put too many layers of colour, it will get dense and muddy and not look as jewel-like. You want the ocean to look jewel-like. So I've switched to a smaller brush. This is my number two silver black velvet and I'm modelling some of the waves here making them a bit frothy, making some wave shapes. I will work a bit more on that later when this is dry. I will use some ultramarine blue and maybe ultramarine blue mixed with burnt sienna and I will put a bit more dark modelling under the waves to make them stand out. But really I need this layer to dry before I can make that judgement on what I need to do to them. And don't forget that you don't need to do everything in one layer. Let it dry. And while I was working on the shore, the eye, the sky dried enough for me to do the ocean without any bleeding of paint into the sky. And that's what you want to happen. So notice I go back and I pick up pigment on my brush all the time so that it's good and loaded with pigment and I can get strong colour. Now I have mixed raw sienna with a little burnt sienna and I'm putting in the sand colour and that is why I did the blue first so I can use a nice big brush and sweep the sand colour in but I know exactly where I have to stop with that colour. And later when I'm very close to finishing the painting I will use some of my Dr. P.H. Martin's white and I will just reclaim a few of the white highlights in the water where I got a bit enthusiastic with the sand colour or I, I took out the white where I wanted white. It's very, very hard to be disciplined and leave the white that you need, especially when you're using a big brush and a big wash. I'll put this sandy colour over the rocks too because that will form the base layer of the rocks, the base colour of the rocks. And when I get close to the, the um, foreground, I'm going to use some quinacridone gold to really intensify the colour in the foreground. It's a much stronger colour. Now, I use raw sienna a lot for sand and for rocks because you can wash the raw sienna back to almost white paper and that can give you some lovely modeling on the rocks. But the quinacridone gold is a staining color and we'll, you won't be able to wash it back. So that's, a, although they're similar colors, that's something you need to think about when you use your pigments. Now I've mixed ultramarine blue with Zalo blue, as a yellow and burnt sienna and I've made a very dark green for the islands in the distance. And I will use the point of my number eight silver black velvet brush to poke up the tops of the trees and then quickly while they're wet so I don't get lots of lines, I will pull down my wash to form the rest of the island. And there were three or four islands, separate little islands and if you paint them separately and let each one dry, even if you use a very similar colour, they will stand out as separate. And because they're in the background, you don't need them to be too detailed. 
they just need to blend into the background. That's a couple of distant islands on the horizon. And then a couple closer up. And I tend to go back in with some burnt sienna to put in some shadows. Or burnt sienna mixed with ultramarine blue to make a really lovely dark grey brown. Modeling the trees and I'll do the closer island when the first one is dry. Now I'm going to give a quick demonstration here of the, how I do the rocks and then you can watch a longer video that I will link to. So I have the raw sienna on the rock and now I'm using a mixture of ultramarine and burnt sienna to do the second layer of the rock. And what I tend to do a lot of the time is, is paint the whole rock with that shadow color, making sure I have more intense color towards the bottom and the shadow side of the rock. And then I'm going to use my thirsty brush to pull back the highlights. That way you get a dark outline around the whole rock without having to do some outlining with a thin brush, which looks, looks very outlined. Whereas this method just gives it a sharp, dark edge without it looking outlined. So I've cleaned my brush in clean water, dried it on my towel, and repeat repeat that process and pull back your highlights and this is where the raw sienna is one of your best choices for your highlights but i will link to another video that shows several methods of doing that so i have meanwhile painted in the foreground rocks using that method and now i am going to use my number four silver black velvet brush to put in the trees that were surrounding this photograph, sort of framing the whole picture. I liked the way they framed the whole picture. Not sure what kind of trees they were. In my mind, they might be arbutus trees, but they definitely had a lot of leaves. So this is a long and quite tedious process. I want to be able to see the sky through a lot of the leaves. I don't want to, to just have a big mess of green. So I'm trying to look at my reference photo and put in most of the leaves individually. And that took some time. I skip ahead so that you don't have to watch the tedious process, but I want to give you an idea of how I did that. Towards the corners and the edges, the leaves were more dense, so sometimes I am less careful. I put in a few branches to start with to give me some direction. And when I put in a lot of the leaves, I put extra branches in afterwards too, to fill up spaces where I feel there needs to be a few branches or where there were branches in the reference photo. When you're doing something this detailed, you can't do it exactly like the reference photo. You need to look at your photo, understand how it is formed, do a few exactly as you see them, and then use what you've learned to sort of build up your own pattern of leaves. Making sure that you leave that negative space, the sky showing through, that's one of the most important parts. Don't fill up the, don't fill up all the negative space. Now, I have not put my palette directly onto my painting in case I've got paint on the bottom and I, I make a mess. I put a nice clean sheet of paper over the dry painting and under my palette to protect the painting. And I'm modeling with the burnt sienna and ultramarine under the waves, giving it a little bit more shadow, a little bit more definition. And in the reflections too, there's some raw sienna and burnt sienna in the reflections. Now I have a dagger brush. They're quite nice for doing leaves too. This is a quarter inch dagger and I'm using that to make a slightly different shape leaf so that they're not all too uniform. You can also make some lovely thin lines for the branches with the dagger. And I go, see I go this direction, that direction. So thank you for watching. <laughs>